Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Shabbat Shalom. I want to welcome everyone uh, watching on our YouTube channel and everyone here today. This uh, era of uh, Pesach, uh, Shabbat, it's called also known as Shabbat Haggadol, the great, the great Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath before, before uh, Passover begins. And uh, for our last day here in this building, we have a very special Passover message that our Chazan, uh, Rusty Atchison, is going to give us. So Lord, let's give blessing on him now and yeah, open our hearts to hear in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Mm. Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Shabbat Shalom. And this evening, Hag Pesach Sameach. We're going to discuss lessons of Passover. And we don't have 48 contiguous hours to go over the lessons of Passover completely. So we're going to focus in on a couple. Because the text is very very deep and there are places that connect back to the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the Pesach sacrifice and there are connections all over the place all the way from Abraham all the way back to creation and all the way forward to what we read in Revelation there are many lessons of Passover so we're just going to focus on a few and ultimately the Passover story as a story itself has a foundation that begins before that. Because if you just come in on Passover, then we're on the evening of the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. So we're going to back up a little bit. And there are three lessons we're going to focus on. One, how God reveals himself to Moses and Israel. Two, the heart condition of Pharaoh and Egypt. And three, the solution for Egypt, what could have been the solution for Egypt, and for us today. So let's talk about that first one. How does God reveal himself to Moses and Israel? He reveals himself as a God of empathy. And that is a very interesting thing. But what is empathy? And empathy is experiencing or having experienced what someone else is feeling. It's not just saying, I think I know what that might be like. It's saying, I've been there. And when we talk about God having empathy, this is literal, as we see in Hebrews chapter 4. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. God is a God of empathy in every way. He has experienced temptation. He has experienced pain and suffering. So when he says, I feel this thing you're feeling, this struggle that you have, whatever it is, if it's the loss of a loved one, if it's a temptation, if it's a frustration, he knows. And you say, great, what does that have to do with Pesach? And for that, we're going to go back to the burning bush. The burning bush is where our protagonist in the story, Moses, is fully introduced as a protagonist. Before the burning bush... The day before the burning bush, he was approximately 80 years old and was a washed up has-been who'd been in exile for 40 years from Egypt. And think about that. He was 80 and from his perspective hadn't done much with his life at that point and he probably wasn't going to do much. But God had other plans. So we see in Shemot, Exodus chapter 3 verse 6, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Avraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. And Moshe hid his face because he was afraid to look toward God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their slave drivers, for I know their pains. And that word, I know, in verse 7, it's ki yadati, I know, for I know their pains. This is not just an intellectual knowledge word. This word can be applied in a lot of ways. For example, it's, it's used in a, a variety of places and in a variety of ways. Another place this is used is in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 4. Now the man knew his wife Eve. This is what we mean when we say, Uh, to know something biblically. So when God says, again, in verse uh, Shemot 3, verse 7, I know their pains, he means this experientially, not from a distance, 
Not as the Romans and Greeks knew their gods who were this, this distant thing or like the Egyptians, this distant power that would interact with them and they might be able to control these things that were not like them at all because God made us in his image. When God says he knows our pain, he means this in a deep, deep way because our God is a personal God. And we see this from Messiah Yeshua as well, showing deep empathy in John chapter 11 in the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. In verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Yeshua wept. So the Jews were saying, see how we loved him. Even knowing what was about to happen, Yeshua still wept because he deeply connected with feelings of loss. He still wept knowing that Lazarus would be breathing in a few minutes. How much more would he weep over everything that had happened to his people, Israel, for generations? We have a God who knows Israel's pains. We have a high priest who knows our weaknesses deeply and intimately. We have Yeshua's empathy to mourners in John chapter 11, to a family suffering a deep loss. We see we have a God of deep empathy. And you might be asking still, uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble connecting, how is God really revealing himself as a God of empathy? Is this just something where we're kind of pulling at and pulling at a thread and seeing what comes out? Or is there a little bit more? And, and there is. Continuing with the burning bush in Shemot, Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. So now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Take my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should take the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, for I will be with you, and this is the sign for you, that it was I who sent you. When you take the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said, Behold, I come to the children of Israel, and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am that I am, or I will be what I will be. And he said, So you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And it's easy to gloss over this, but there's a problem here. Why does God say, I am that I am? So you say, Tell him I am sent me. Is I am his first or his last name or both? Is his middle name that? There's an issue. Why is God cutting his name short here? Saying, uh, I am that I am. Vayamerele himel Moshe, God said to Moses, Ehye asher ehye, I am that I am. So tell them, Ehye sent you. Why does he cut it short? And the rabbis have a conversation. The sages have a discussion about this. And they say, why did he cut it short? Well, I am that I am conveys a sense of infinity, but it also conveys a sense that God is always with us. He always has been with us, and he always will be with us. And they they have this conversation about how there was more of a back and forth between Moses and God. And whether that is true or not, it conveys an interesting principle. And it explains the shift. And it goes something like this. God tells Moses, Ehe asher ehe, meaning... I am, or I will be, I have been with Israel through their current subjugation, their current struggle, their current predicament in Egypt, and I will be, I will be with Israel forever throughout all of their future subjugations and all of their future punishments. And Moses tells God, I cannot go to them with that story, a people in slavery in Egypt, and look them in the face and tell them, hey, the God who has been with us in this current slavery, he'll be with us in all the future slaveries, don't worry. They'll kill me. And so Moses says, you're right, you don't need to tell them everything you know, just tell them, I am, the God who is with you now, sent me to you. And the sages acknowledge that God is a God of extreme empathy, that he identified with his people. Because all through the Torah, we see that God is not this distant being on high, He walks with us in a garden. He wrestles with us. He saves us time and time again. And that's just in Genesis. We have already laid the foundation that our God is a personal God. He's not this distant force that we can try to figure out how to manipulate. He is far beyond that. And he is deep in our hearts. 
And continuing at the burning bush, after this, Moses tells God, well, they still might not believe me. And so God tells them, well, tell you what, I'm going to give you these, these three miracles. Uh, take your staff and throw it down. And Moses does, and it turns into a snake, and he freaks out and runs away. And God says, no, 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 come back, grab the snake, grabs the snake, picks it back up, turns back into a staff. And he says, well, if they don't believe that, and they'll believe this. Take your hand and put it next to your bosom, take it out, and it's leprous, it's white, like death. And then do that again, and it's healthy again. And then in verse 8 of chapter 4, and it will come to pass, they do not believe you, they do not heed the voice of your first sign, they'll believe the voice of the last sign. It will come to pass, if they do not believe either of these two signs, they do not heed your voice, you shall take the water of the Nile and spill it upon the dry land, and the water that you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry land. Why these three miracles? And these were things that, if, if you were in Moses' shoes, knowing that the sorcerers could, to a degree, replicate these, you might tell God, could you give me some better miracles? Things that would make them go, oh wow, we can't do that. So it wasn't this wow factor of these miracles. Why was God giving these to Moses? And ultimately was so Israel would know that God had sent Moses. So why these three signs? We don't have time to go into all three. Rabbi David Foreman makes an excellent point that these three signs are indicative of God's empathy for Israel's struggle. And the last sign is the easiest to understand and explain. So we'll discuss that one. The water into blood. Think about this. What is the worst thing, the worst that Egypt ever did to Israel? It wasn't sending taskmasters and tax collectors after them. It wasn't enslaving them. There's a lot of bad things they did. The absolute worst thing was when the midwives weren't able to kill the babies at birth. Pharaoh gave a command in Exodus chapter 1 verse 22. Pharaoh commanded all his people, not, not the royal guard, all his people saying, Every son who was born you shall cast into the Nile, and every daughter you shall allow to live. This is a way to exterminate a people, if successful. That is the worst thing they ever did. Sneaking into homes, stealing Jewish babies from their cribs, or ripping them out of their mother's arms, and throwing them into a river. So every Jew saw the Nile for what it actually was. The Nile River was filled with the bodies of Jewish babies. Its flowing waters erasing the evidence that their baby boys had ever existed. Every Jew in Egypt saw that river for what it was, bloody water. When God had Moses draw the water and pour it out, Israel knew that God had not forgotten what Egypt had done to them and so casually excused the drowning of their baby boys. God was showing Moses with those signs. I care. I know. This thing that Egypt has done, and they've so casually watched the evidence get washed away, and that gleaming Nile, and they're going about casually every day. I know. I saw it. I experienced it. Every baby. You want to know how? Take some water out. What is it? Water. Pour it on the ground. What is it now? blood. They knew at that point, God knows. He's not this distant God. He knows. Yadati, our pain. <clears throat> we see in God's words how he identifies himself to Moses by name. Ehye asher ehye, I am with you. We see through Messiah Yeshua, God has deep empathy. And we see even in the signs he gives Moses, he is aware of our struggles. He is aware of our problems. He knows on a deep level. He knows biblically, intimately, what is going on. God is not from a distance. He was right there the entire time. The first lesson we see in Exodus, that God reveals himself to Moses and Israel through empathy, through identifying with their struggle. And the second item that we see with that empathy 
is the heart condition of Pharaoh in Egypt. And the heart condition God wanted to see. Because there's a whole exodus that could have been. Because God loved Pharaoh, as odd as that may sound. And he wanted to see humility and repentance in Pharaoh. That was God's ultimate objective. God wanted humility. And he always wants our humility. And he always wants our repentance. No matter how far down a certain road we've gone. No matter what you've done. God wants to see that in you. He wants to see it in your heart. Our ultimate example of humility, of course, is in Messiah Yeshua. Who in Philippians chapter 2, and Elise and I don't coordinate anything on this, but she already read the verse, but read it again. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Yeshua had the most cause, the most reason of anyone in the history of the world to have an ego or to have pride more than any of us. And he didn't. He had no pride. He had no ego. That is our example. That when the fullness of God is made manifest in man, it was with humility. So we see God disciplining Pharaoh through this, this whole story, and it starts out fairly light, and then it gets heavier over time. And God says in a number of places... It's written, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We see a pattern that God was wanting humility and repentance from Egypt, especially in Pharaoh as the ruler of Egypt. And there's one wrench we can throw into the gears here. You might say, but wait, we've got a problem. Didn't God harden Pharaoh's heart and stop him from repenting? How can you say God wanted Pharaoh's repentance when he kept throwing roadblock after roadblock in the way by hardening his heart? <laughs> Valid question. A lot, of, a lot of it is stemmed from problematic translations, so we'll address that. Exodus 7 verse 3, God says, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and I will increase my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. In verse, uh, chapter 10 verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, in order that I might place these signs of mine in his midst. We have these words, harden and strengthen. We have it on the overhead. We have the word harden, which is kasha, or uh, more commonly chavad. And we also have the word for strengthen, which is chazak. And many translations play loose with how they translate these. So don't rely on the English. Look at what the actual Hebrew word there is, because you'll often see chazak, strengthen, translated harden. And most of you are very familiar with the word chazak because each time we fi finish a book of the Torah, we all shout chazak, chazak, v'nit chazak, strength, strength, and may we be strengthened. We're all familiar with this word. We don't say hardness, hardness, and may we be hardened. That'd be strange. <laughs> there are two very different meanings, hence the two words. So chazak, if God is strengthening you, these are different words. So let's take a look at in Shemot Exodus chapter 7. But I will harden va'ani akshay Pharaoh's heart, and I will increase my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. So God says, he's, I'm going to harden his heart. And we'll look at how exactly that happens. But then also in 10 verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh. For I have hardened. Ani hichbati. That word, harden. Chaved, or Chavad. So God says he's going to harden. But as we go through the story, what actually happens each time? And the word for strengthen is also used for Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 4. When he says, but I will strengthen his heart, and he will not send out the people. Strengthen, Chazak. 
So which is it? Was God hardening Pharaoh's heart, or was he strengthening his heart? If God, throughout the story, when a plague would happen, he reached in and and hardened Pharaoh's heart, made him unreceptive to any kind of repentance, then that is very problematic. If God was giving Pharaoh the strength to carry on, that is very different. So let's take a look at it. We have in Exodus chapter 7, verse 13 and 22, with the staff becoming snakes and the Nile turning into blood, plague number one, it says, but Pharaoh's heart was steadfast or strong, chazak. And then upon relief from plague number two, the frogs, be'achach bed, when Pharaoh's heart saw there was relief, he hardened his heart. Pharaoh did that to himself. God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart there. Pharaoh did. Plague number three. We see the necromancers couldn't replicate the lice. The necromancer said to Pharaoh, It is the finger of God, but Pharaoh's heart remained by Echazak, strong, steadfast, and he did not hearken to them. Plague number four. God removed the noxious creatures, the flies, but Pharaoh hardened by Yachbed. So each time through this, God has not intervened at all in Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh has been relying on his own pride and his own ego. After the death of the livestock, number five, Pharaoh sent out and behold, not even one of the livestock of Israel died, but Pharaoh's heart became hardened by Ichbad, hardened, and he did not let the people out. So we're halfway through the plagues, and God hasn't had to step in one bit. Pharaoh has seen a lot happen to his nation, and he has experienced some of it personally. And he is still carrying through on his own pride and his own ego. This is very deep, and this is very problematic. Up to this point, God has not interjected one bit. After plague number six, and this is the first time we see God directly affect Pharaoh in the plagues. After the plague of boils. But the Lord strengthened by Hazek Pharaoh's heart. And he did not hearken to them as the Lord spoke to Moses. Why did God strengthen his heart and why now? I will submit this to you. God did not want to beat Pharaoh into submission. And here's why. If you become regretful over the pain your sin has caused you, you are not repentant. You are regretful. You are remorseful, but that is not repentance. If you're simply not able to take the pain of your sin, you are not repentant before God. Regret and repentance are two different things. Many people are deeply regretful over their sin. Through most of these plagues, Pharaoh was regretful over the pain his sin was causing. And he came to Moses and said, please make this stop. And then as soon as he got Moses to make it stop, he went right on going. Then we see after the hail and fire in plague number seven, Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, so he continued to sin. And he hardened by Yachbed his heart and his servants. Here, Pharaoh hardened his heart He didn't need God or anyone to do that for him. His own pride and his own ego again kicked in, even seeing the fire inside of the ice. And then later in chapter 9, and Pharaoh's heart was strengthened by Chazak, and he did not let the children of Israel go out, and the Lord had spoken through the hand of Moses. Pharaoh was able to harden and strengthen his heart through all of these things going on, through seeing his entire nation humiliated. Now, maybe I think a little too highly of my countrymen. I believe if a prophet came to Washington, D.C. and, and struck, uh, struck the waters there, and all of the waters in the country turned to blood, I think the entire nation would take notice. I think if they threw up some dirt in the air and it turned into to lice or all the livestock were dying and there was a single prophet that was behind this, I think people would take notice. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've underestimated the, the pride that we have here in Western civilization, but maybe not. 
But we see Pharaoh and most of Egypt powering through because they could not dream of submitting themselves to God. They were choosing not to. They were up against something they couldn't control and had no power over. But they were being shown for what they had in their hearts. Pride, arrogance, ego. After the plague of the locust, plague number eight. But the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart. Vayachazek. Again, that was done by God. God strengthened Pharaoh's heart. He said, no, I don't want you to quit. I'm going to strengthen your heart. and We're going to find out what's in there. If there's a little bit of repentance, that's going to come out. If there's pride, if there's ego, if there's arrogance, if there's haughtiness, if you're just looking to exalt yourself, I'm going to give you the strength to keep going because we're not done yet. After the plague of darkness, number nine, Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go, worship the Lord. But, and whenever you see the word but, eh, that's a problem. It rarely indicates something good. It's a great word to get rid of your dictionary from. For example, David, you look great today. But, eh, I'm about to say something that directly contradicts it. So, Pharaoh says, go, worship the Lord. But your flocks and cattle shall be left. Your young children may also go with you. It is not Pharaoh gracious here. He'll let them take their young kids, but not their flocks. He is still trying to exert some control. But Moses said, you too shall give sacrifices and burnt offerings into our hands, for we will make them for the Lord our God. And also our cattle will go with us. Not a single hoof will remain. For we will take them to worship the Lord our God. And we do not know how much we will worship the Lord until we arrive there. Of note, worship and sacrifice here meant the same thing. The Lord strengthened by Chazek Pharaoh's heart. And he was unwilling to let them out. If that moment had been a moment of Pharaoh's genuine repentance, not the fake repentance he'd shown a little bit before, but the genuine repentance, not regret, that verse would have read differently. It would have read something more like the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart and he repented and apologized to Moses, but it's not what it says. If Pharaoh's heart had repentance, it would have been amplified when God strengthened his heart. And then just before the death of the firstborn in chapter 11, verse 10, Moses and Aaron had performed all these miracles before Pharaoh, but the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the children of Israel out of his land. By Chazek, strengthened. God genuinely, deeply, and passionately wanted repentance from Egypt. And he goes out of his way to intervene in Pharaoh's heart to give him the strength to not just simply give regret or remorse, which only brings on resentment, but he wanted repentance from Pharaoh. When we don't like the consequences of our sin, and we simply stop sinning because we can't take the consequences, that is not repentance. And we have very much confused those things. If I overeat a dramatic amount of junk food and I balloon up to 300 pounds and I go, wow, this really isn't healthy, and so I go on a diet, it doesn't mean I suddenly decided I hate the junk food. It just means I don't like what it's done to me. And we spend a lot of time figuring out that we actually do like the sin, we just don't like the impact it has in our lives. And we all do this to a degree and it should disturb us. Because that is our flesh coming through, and it's not the Spirit of God working in us. There was a study, it wasn't a study, it was a poll, and they asked a bunch of married men and women, if there were no consequences whatsoever, if they would have an affair. As in, no one would ever know, there would be zero consequence from it, would you have an affair? The overwhelming majority said, Yes. That's disturbing. It's also indicative that we often simply don't like the consequences of something, and that is what stops us from doing it. The consequence. Not a genuine or heartfelt obedience to God, but we don't want the consequence. 
We see in Exodus 14, and the Lord strengthened Baal the heart of Pharaoh, and the king of Egypt. He chased after the children of Israel. So we strengthen Pharaoh's heart again, and what do we get? Pride. His advisors had come to him saying, Egypt is lost. What are we even doing? But we saw in Pharaoh an extreme pride, an extreme ego, an extreme arrogance. Each step of the way, as God was trying to get a repentance out of them, Pharaoh's heart was hardened because he saw God's power. He saw God's might. And instead of being humbled at it, he hated it. And many of us will see that too. When you genuinely bring the gospel, when you genuinely bring the word of God to people, many will believe, many will have faith, and you will see much of the world despise it. Andrew Murray writes in his book, Humility, the only humility that is really ours is not that which we try to show before God in prayer, but that which we carry with us and carry out in our ordinary conduct. The insignificances of daily life are the importances and tests of eternity because they prove what really is the spirit that possesses us. The ordinary part of Egyptian life was pride and hatred. The ordinary part of Egyptian life was enslaving other peoples, hating non-Egyptians, throwing their babies into a river, or trying to have them killed at birth. This was ordinary to them. And we should look at that and be concerned when we look at the state of our own country and our own larger civilization. And humility can be a tricky thing to call someone out on because it makes people really uncomfortable very quickly. I was actually given uh, Andrew Murray's book, Humility, many years ago. And I was, a, I was a young man, very young man. And unbeknownst to me, this couple had bought an entire box of these books and they were handing them out to everyone. Uh, but I didn't see that. I just saw them come up to me and say, hey, we think you'd like this book. And if you ever want to make someone really uncomfortable or mess with them, hand them a book and say, I think this is for you. And it's titled Humility and just walk away. <laughs> it's like, uh, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> Egypt had a practice, a cultural practice of pride. And their culture down to its core was wicked. God revealed himself to Israel as a God of empathy. Even as we go through the plagues, God was strengthening Pharaoh's heart because he didn't want a resentful Pharaoh that only caved because he couldn't take the plagues anymore. He wanted real repentance. So we've gone through the first two lessons. God revealed himself to Moses in Israel through, as a God of empathy. And the heart condition of Pharaoh in Egypt was revealed to be prideful, was revealed to be unrepentant, but God wanted humility. He wanted repentance. And on the overhead, the solution for Egypt and for us today, it comes down to identity. And that brings us to Passover. So we'll begin with a question. Why did God kill Egypt's firstborn sons? Why that? And God kind of answers it in Exodus chapter 4. He says, And you shall say to Pharaoh, talking to Moses, So said the Lord, my firstborn son, B'nai the Hori, is Israel. So I say to you, send out my son so that he will worship me. But if you refuse to send him out, behold, I am going to slay your firstborn son, Bencha Bechorecha. So we have that word Bechor which is firstborn. What is a Bechor? Besides receiving an extra inheritance, the firstborn son, especially in ancient cultures, was responsible to carry on the family culture and the values of his father. Biblically, this was not always the literal firstborn. Isaac was Abraham's, not Ishmael. Jacob was Isaac's, not Esau. Joseph was Jacob's, not, not Reuben, not Simeon, not Judah we see him give Joseph a double blessing through his sons. 
Israel being God's firstborn means that it is Israel's job and position to bring God's values to the rest of the world. This is also why God punishes Israel so severely when straying from his path. Israel is supposed to be a representation of its father's, God's, values. And remember, those whom God loves, he chastens. And this is awesome. This is really awesome. God trusts Israel. He gives us the duty to carry his principles, his values of humility, of love, of valuing life into the rest of the world. He places a calling on us. So again, why did he kill Egypt's firstborn? Egypt was a nation based around pride and ego, and their leader had been consistently exalting himself to God. They had generations raised with an ideology of hating non-Egyptians, treating them as vermin, killing their male babies either at birth or later drowning them in the Nile. This is the culture that was being passed Lador Vador from generation to generation, from father to Bahor. God's killing the Egyptian firstborn sons was not just poetic justice for refusing to let his firstborn son Israel go. It was also to completely interrupt the transmission of wicked and corrupt principles and values Egypt had been passing from generation to generation. A value system of pride, ego, hatred, and murder. And when God kills Egypt's firstborn sons, he interrupts that transmission of values. Does any of this feel familiar today? Where we have a value system that is proactively taught, where we value pride over humility where we are nearly institutionally teaching hatred instead of love, where instead of having patience, we teach ego, and we openly endorse the murder of infants instead of valuing life. We should look at this, and this should be disturbing. We're not exactly to the point of throwing babies into the river through signed fiat executive order by the president, but when we look at where we are at, it should be disturbing. And so now, we're at Pesach. In Exodus 12, you shall have a perfect male lamb in its first year. And you may take it either from the sheep or from the goats, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil in the houses in which they eat it. And I, God, will pass through the land of Egypt on this night. And I will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And upon the gods of Egypt, I wreak judgments, I the Lord. And the blood will be for you for a sign upon the houses where you will be. And I will see the blood and skip over you. And there will be no plague to destroy you when I smite the people of the land of Egypt." There was no genetic get-out-of-jail-free card. God didn't care if you were an Israelite, if you were in Egypt, if you were an American. He didn't care that night. There was one thing that mattered that evening. Were you covered by the blood of the Lamb? That was the only thing that came down to. When God says, it will be a sign... The blood would be a sign. That word sign is oat in Hebrew. God put an oat on Cain. The flood, after the flood, the, the rainbow was an oat. Circumcision is an oat of our covenant with God. Shabbat is an oat that God is creator and that Israel is his. That blood of the lamb was an oat. And it set us apart. Whether you were Egyptian or whether you were Israelite, it set you apart from everyone else in Egypt, because that was over all of Egypt. And after everyone had seen God's wonder and all of the plagues, everything that had happened, everyone had a choice to make. Are you going to submit, 
or are you going to go on your own and figure this out on your own? I cannot fathom personally, of course, I've never seen water turn to blood. I've never seen livestock just in mass die right in front of me. I've never seen dirt turned into lice. I've never seen it rain, fire, and hail mixed into one piece. Systematically, each of those miracles humiliated the God of the Egyptians. So each and every one of them knew they were up against something that their own pharaoh and their own sorcerers could not control. So what happens now? Do we have repentance? Or do we have pride? And a refusal to submit, knowing it will lead to death. And that night, it became a matter of identity. Not Israelite versus Egyptian. Not Jew versus Gentile. It was, are you covered by the blood of the lamb or not? The only people who were not identified by the sign of the blood of the lamb were the ones who did not want to be. The solution for Egypt then and the solution for our problems today are ultimately the same. The only sign that matters is willful submission to God and being under the blood of the Lamb. That is what all of it boiled down to. After all of the plagues, God showing his power over all of Egypt, some still resisted. We will see this in the end of days as well. In Revelation chapter 12, our identity is in the Lamb. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Just like back the first Passover evening as the angel of death went across Egypt finding every home that was not covered by the blood of the Lamb and taking the soul of the firstborn son. It will be in the end of days that the only identity that is going to matter is are you covered by the blood? That trumps being Jew versus Gentile, any political party, any race. When you stand before God, how do you identify yourself? Are you covered by the blood of the Lamb? And this, this is a real question. How do we identify ourselves? What are we? Republican or Democrat? White? Black? Asian? Whatever you put, before blood of the lamb, whatever you put before part of God's firstborn, that is your pride. That is your ego. Because Pharaoh could not come to that point. God kept strengthening him, getting him to go on and on and on, giving him chance after chance after chance to not throw in the towel and say, I quit. Because I can't take it anymore. The weight of my sin is just too much. God wanted a changed heart. Even up to the very end. God kept strengthening his heart up to the very end. But Pharaoh could not bring himself to be under the blood of the lamb. He couldn't do it. And he ended up paying the price for that. All of this boils down to, as we are on a Rev Pesach, a matter of identity. Who are we? And we see a nation deeply divided in a number of ways. And throughout every generation, it is not a matter of the right political arguments. It's not a matter of the right philosophical arguments. Like in every generation, this is a gospel issue. And when you bring the gospel into it, when you bring the blood of the Lamb into it, these problems wash away. And God cleanses it. Would the music team please come up? Would you join me in prayer? The <sighs> Venus Shavat Shemayim, our Father in heaven. Lord, it is your deliverance that we praise you for, for how you brought us out of the land of Egypt. And that story that we tell, and many of us will retell to our children tonight, the story of how you took us from slavery to freedom. You delivered us. Lord, I ask that you would draw us together under the blood of the Lamb. Lord, you show us 
your empathy, that you are a God who loves and a God who cares, a God who draws close, and you want to lead us in repentance, not regret. You want genuine, heartfelt repentance that we can walk after you. Lord, deliver us from Egypt, from slavery, from our sin. We ask that you would make us like Messiah Yeshua, that we would know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that we would made, be made conformed to his death. For it is in that hope we have the resurrection of the dead, that you deliver us from sin and from death. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask that you would bless the time we have together. I ask you to bless the hearts of everyone here and everyone who is listening. We thank you for these signs and these remembrances that you give us. And we praise you, Lord, for the deliverance that you bring us through from slavery into freedom. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Amen.